Uh, you are most uh, welcome, and I want uh, particularly to, to welcome our uh, renowned speaker here today, Dr. Henning Steinfeld from, from FAO. Uh, and uh, he will very soon start the show, so to say. I, I want to give, though, a, a small, small um, background or introduction fro from us at, uh, at the Future Agriculture. And um, that is why, sort of, we invited uh, Dr. Steinfeld and, and wanted him to come here. And um, that is that because the, the Swedish global development agenda is, is, um, is supposed to be very sustainable. It's sustainable is a key word in these circles. And um, if you look back to, to the Harlem Brundtland definition of, of sustainability, it's based on three pillars, social, economical, and environmental uh, sustainability. And I think, uh, perhaps at this university or in other circles as well, that we forget to, we, we tend to forget the two first pillars, social and economical uh, sustainability, and focus entirely on, on environmental um, sustainability. And within the future agriculture program or, or platform, we try to, to merge these all aspects, not just looking into one of the aspects, but to put all together. And as you will hear, Dr. Steinfeld uh, in his work has really tried to, to, to put all this together. And I think that is, is a significant achievement. So if we look to some, some of, the, of the key aspects in, in, the, in the Swedish uh, policy for global, global development, it's... it's uh, threat from climate change, it's the environmental degradation, it's the gender dynamics, it's um, poverty alleviation, and also over the last years it's food security, even though that is not pushed so much yet, but it's, it's there. And that is an alignment, I think, to the, to the larger international uh, agenda, uh, so Sweden adopting to that more and more. And looking into these dimensions of, of the Swedish global uh, development ambitions, you could very well put uh, livestock in the center here. Uh, the impact of and, and effects from the climate change, the environmental uh, dimensions, food security is very obvious. The nutritious food, it's not only staples and, 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 and calories, it's also proteins. Uh, the poverty link, it's a way out of poverty. And also there are very relevant and important uh, gender aspects that you have to take into account when you deal with, with livestock in, um, in a development context. And just to remind us a little bit what, what is happening out there. We have a larger middle class, an increasing richer middle class in the world. We have more people in the world, and the demand is projected to continue to increase globally. So there is, you know these figures that we have to increase the, um, the, the, the food production and also the, the a sensible use of food, but this is is these old figures, just to show that these projections are, are uh, reasonable or true. It's about the poultry sector in Asia. It's FAO statistics. And you can see here, especially in East and Southeast Asia, it's, it's a tremendous increase over the years. And this continues. And that is true. I think that uh, perhaps poultry is the most expanding sector, but other, aspect, uh, other sectors of, of the livestock sector is also expanding tremendously. So there's a, a big driver out there. And another aspect I think it's worthwhile to mention is the asymmetries in consumption and impact. And this is from the Human Development Report and FAO statistics. So it's a little bit old, but the principle is there. And here is the, the carbon emissions per capita uh, in, in tons, US, Mali, and then consumptions of meat per capita. So there are a lot of, of, of asymmetries here that we have to take into account. 
And another asymmetry, which I think is important for us here in our wealthy country, uh, is the asymmetries in priorities. And this is from the State of Food and Agriculture 2010. It's about how we regard uh, the livestock production. And in post-industrial, in our, a country like ours, it's mainly human health issue or environmental issue. Whereas, for instance, in, in low developed country, it's the livelihood and food security. And I think we have to, to, to consider this, to, to, to think about that, that uh, the livestock sector is viewed very differently in different countries in the world. So finally then, uh, the way forward. Is there an international convergence? Is, is there a possibility to put these things, these various aspects together and move forward? And if so, what is the role of research in that process? What could we here at this university contribute to? And that's why we, we asked uh, Dr. Steinfeld to come here and, 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 and tell us. <laughs> and, and because it's, I, I think it, it's a true global issue, and the train is moving now, whether we like it or not. It's a tremendous expansion here. It's a tremendous expansion. And we have to relate to that one. <coughs> so that's why we from, from the Future Agriculture wanted, uh, and we are very happy that you accepted the invitation to, to, to coming here. And uh, I could just give a very brief introduction about uh, Dr. Steinfeld. He is, he's an agriculture economist. Uh, he, he started his career with very hands-on uh, practical development projects in, in Africa. And then he, he moved to, to FAO. And, uh, I've been worked on, on livestock uh, policy, policies and, and sector analysis for, for the last 20 years or so. He's um, a famous uh, editor or writer of the Livestock Long Shadow. That is some five, six years ago. Um, and um, he has also, of course, given hundreds of speeches like uh, on, on this topic. Uh, over the years, and, and uh, also at, at renowned universities like Stanford and Princeton. So after that, we consider, well, it's worthwhile taking them here to, to our university as well. So please, Henning, the floor is yours. You're most welcome. Yes, uh, thank you, Ulf, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. I hope I don't... Uh, uh, encroach into your lunch, or your, whether you've had it or not. <laughs> but uh, I'll try to uh, briefly give you an overview of uh, how the thinking has developed after FAO published the Livestock's Long Shadow, which in many regards has been a controversial document. It uh, actually uh, has been also controversial in my own institution, uh, which I regard uh, rather unfortunate because, uh, as Ulf has pointed out, the the problem we are dealing with um, in terms of uh, the uh, expansion of uh, demand for particularly high quality food is, is a global question. It is a global resource question and is also a global development question. Okay. So um, I will, don't know to the extent that you know the global livestock sector. I will, of course, from FAO try to give you a little bit of a, of a global overview. And here you see um, how much meat is consumed in, in different countries. And as Ulf has already pointed out, it goes from almost nothing to quite a lot. Uh, I think the uh, highest consumption will be in places like US, uh, Spain, uh, Australia, where more than 130 kilograms per person are consumed. And then you have Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where consumption of meat would be less than 20 kilograms per person. And in, it is in these countries where, uh, in addition, in terms of um, meat consumption, but also other animal products would be uh, of great value to the development of, of humans and children in particular. Um, a little bit also out of curiosity, uh, just to show that 
the world is quite diverse in what the main animal protein source is. You see the, the, the red countries are sort of the ruminant countries, where either beef or small ruminant meat is consumed. Then there's a large part of the world that is actually uh, poultry countries, the US and uh, the Near East are typical poultry countries, if you want. Then there is uh, Central Europe and China, and these are pig countries, you know, where pig is the predominant source of uh, animal protein. And you even have some milk countries, you know, like uh, Finland or India. This is, these would be countries where milk would be the predominant source of animal protein. And then there are also some fish countries, you know, like Ghana, like Uganda, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, J Japan, Philippines. These would be fish countries. Um, very often we put everything together, you know, and if you look at total animal protein, there is a very close connection between income and total consumption of animal protein. Japan, for example, has not so much meat, but high, high incomes, and there's a lot of fish that goes into the consumption of uh, fish in, in, in Japan. Um, here is uh, what uh, Ulf has already mentioned, that uh, we have a, a quite a strong expansion of meat consumption in, uh, in the world, particularly in developing countries, and there is one shooting star, and that is poultry. Poultry is a commodity that is quite easily produced. It's off-the-shelf technology that is transferable from one country to the other with relative ease, and this is why we've seen the highest growth rates uh, in poultry. Poultry is also a product that has less fat and, and other uh, supposedly negative byproducts or components in, in, its, in its meat, so it is, from a health perspective, more readily accepted and doesn't have any cultural problems because a lot of people around the world don't eat, eat pork or don't uh, eat beef for various social cultural reasons, and poultry has nothing of that sort. So pork is uh, the strongest growing, uh, poultry is the strongest growing, followed, followed by pork, followed by ovine meat, small ruminant meat, and you see that beef in developed countries is actually in decline. So is a small ruminant meat in, in developed countries. <coughs> as opposed to that, uh, or say as a complementary information, we're having uh, a development that is quite worrying to some of us. And this shows the commodity prices of uh, the globally traded commodities. It includes agriculture commodities, it includes uh, metals and oil and so on. Uh, but there seems to be, and you all remember, there was a big spike that uh, occurred just before the economic crisis started in, in uh, summer 2008, where commodity prices were at their peak. Then the world economy went into recession, particularly pronounced in Europe and the US, but also Japan. So there was a slump in commodity prices, and three years after, even without having a full recovery, we are at the peak again. So the question really is, is this a, a blip? Or is there something more fundamental? Is something changing with regard to resource availability and resource prices? And I tend to believe that this is actually a secular change, that the, there is something like an end of cheap food and that food and agriculture have to uh, address the question of resource scarcity much more than we ever did. So it calls for a paradigm change in how we treat resources in food and agriculture and it also calls for efficiency gains, and I'm coming to that uh, in further detail. Just to focus a little bit on the agriculture sector and price development there, and here I've just listed the two major commodities that go into animal feed, uh, soya bean and, and maize, and you see a very similar trend that is generally upwards, of course, with some ups and downs down the line. But the point I want to make is that there seems to be a long term inversion of the trend, you know, you had declining commodity tr uh, prices over basically 50 years from 1950 to 2000, and somewhere in the first decade of the century, there seems to be uh, a change in prices. So uh, coming back to the livestock sector, uh, Ulf has already said the global demand will continue to grow. The projection is 70 to 80 percent, depending on whether you talk about meat or milk. It's stagnating mainly in rich countries, but it is still strong in emerging countries. Emerging countries here are China, Brazil, India, Mexico, South Africa, and so on. So middle income countries, still a lot of growth. And the poorest country of the world, 
are now catching up quite quickly because we're having growth rates in Africa of 5 to 6 percent. We've had them for the last 10 years. And here you see uh, fermentation going on and people moving into the lower end of the middle class. And this is why we see something like a 200 percent increase in uh, Africa, uh, expansion of, of consumption projected for the next 40 years. So uh, this is quite significant. And the question, of course, is how do we reconcile this with the, the other picture, which is the growing scarcities and risk when it comes to environmental and natural resources. And uh, oil, land, water, energy, phosphorus are all critical inputs to agriculture and to livestock production, but they become scarcer and scarcer. Uh, there's a debate whether we have peaked supplies of oil or phosphorus and so on, but even if we haven't peaked, uh, the extraction costs are going up, and we have to live with the prospect of increasing prices for quite some time, maybe forever. There's also environmental degradation and pollution that affects the availability of natural resources, and it degrades them, it lowers their value, and there is the big unknown variable of climate change, which can work both positive and negative. Uh, maybe in the case of Sweden, it may be rather positive because it it increases the area from which you can produce and gives you more favorable climate, but uh, for many other regions, this will be rather disastrous. And uh, I can only mention here uh, the pastoralists, which are in work operating and living in the most marginal and most threatened climatic environments who will probably be at the brunt of um, the effects of climate change. So here is our point of departure and a little bit the long shadow as we had described it about five years ago. Uh, the huge land use of livestock, uh, 3.5 billion hectares as pasture. Uh, the fact that one third of all cropland, and here we are talking about 500 million hectares, are designated uh, to produce feed in the developed countries, and Sweden I don't think is an exception here, it is more than 50% of the total arable land that produces feed. It doesn't produce directly food, it produces feed. Um, the anthropogenic biomass appropriation is 60% that goes to livestock. Freshwater use, uh, no, that's not freshwater use, it's agricultural water use, that includes blue water, green water, and gray water, is 29% uh, of agriculture. And uh, we are recalculating the impact on climate change and the closest guess I can give at this point is about 15%, which is less than what we have um, calculated at the time of the long shadow. The reason being that overall inc increases have been larger, so uh, because of combustion and so on in the meantime. And uh, another important factor is the fact that um, deforestation has slowed down in South America and less CO2 is resulted as a as less CO2 is emitted as a result of um, uh, conversion of uh, forest into pastures. Contributions of uh, livestock are also quite significant, maybe not so much in terms of food, uh, even though it is also important there. It is economically quite significant, even if this is not a very high figure, but it is important in rural areas. And it is importantly also a livelihood component for about one billion people who uh, depend either fully or partially on livestock as a form of survival, often in the absence of any other thing, uh, of not being able to produce food crops, of not having a job somewhere. So it is the last resort for many people who have no other way of uh, surviving. So um, why then do I focus here particularly on livestock and natural resources? There are a couple of issues with livestock that put livestock aside from the rest of crop of, of agriculture, and that is that uh, the production of animal protein, particularly when you use high value inputs, is typically less efficient than that of plant protein, something that I don't need to explain to you, because you're using another organism to, 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 uh, to convert something that theoretically could be used also by humans directly, at least to a certain extent. The second aspect is the aspect of remoteness, that very often we find livestock in areas that are inaccessible, that have poor infrastructure, where often the state is not present. Think of the tribal areas in Pakistan, or think of Somalia, or think of the Sahel, or even think of the forest in the Amazon, 
where there is no public authority that would sort of be able to exert any control over what is happening. And this is why you have a neglect, institutional and policy neglect. You're having expansion into forests of people just burning down the forest without being controlled. And overgrazing and the tragedy of commons, the fact that institutions aren't present in, in, in very remote and marginal areas in Africa, uh, in, in Asia and elsewhere. The third aspect is maybe something that is more related to what is happening in Europe and developed countries, but also increasingly in developing countries, East Asia, for example, the rapid expansion of intensive systems of pigs and poultry and also dairy production that are often detached from the supporting feed base. So the feed base is transported, is imported from elsewhere, and that uh, creates problems at both ends, both ends in terms of the feed that is produced somewhere where then nutrients are missing and where you produce livestock you have the problem of nutrient overloads and the resultant environmental problems. So um, the point of departure is that there are specific issues that the livestock sector has in terms of nutrient use efficiency, in terms of geographic dispersion and in terms of geographic clustering. But then there is also uh, the recognition that this demand growth that I've talked about will continue, whether we like it or not. And uh, this demand growth in some way needs to be accommodated within finite resources, within what we have available. And if possible, we need to shrink the environmental footprint of that expansion so as to leave more for future generations. At the same time, the livestock sector is an engine of growth in many uh, rural countries, so uh, developing countries are willing to exploit these, this potential for social health and economic gains and use the livestock sector for, for these benefits. And I think we uh, should encourage them to do that and not blame them for that. So efficiency of natural resource use is what I want to go in a little bit more in detail. What we mean here is the efficiency by which uh, land, water, nutrients, and energy are converted into livestock products. Um, you may argue that uh, not all of that is relevant because you have areas like northern Sweden, for example, where water is not an issue. There's plenty of it, so why would you want to be efficient in water use? Uh, but elsewhere, this is not the case. So here, the, uh, it may, there may be local differences, but globally, uh, it is important to make the conversion more efficient. Uh, we believe and we have cursory anal analysis done on the efficiency of uh, resource use and we have found that there are huge differences, huge gaps in efficiency that exist both within a country and then also between countries that are comparable. And uh, substituting for natural resources can be done by improving knowledge and technology in some sort of a substitution process where um, you know, human-made inputs in the form of technology and knowledge can make up for uh, resource use, natural resource use. Coming back to what I said before, the particular issue of uh, livestock here, the non-CO2 emissions, emission intensities, and you see that ruminants really stick out as being uh, the most polluting uh, um, sector if you want, and this is expressed per ton of protein. So it is trying to put everything a little bit into, into the same denominator. So uh, everything here is emission intensity, that is tons of CO2 equivalent emission per ton of protein produced. And uh, that is then within the within livestock picture. Again, you see that beef is, is highest in terms of emission. Again, this is expressed in um, CO2 equivalent emissions per animal protein. Uh, beef is, ranges from 80 to 160, and pork and broilers and milk and eggs are much lower than that, and uh, broilers are probably the most, the least uh, emission intensive form of, of livestock production. <clears throat> Just to look a little bit more into beef and maybe trying to find out why emissions are so high. Uh, um, so uh, there is a part of beef that is produced by the dairy herd, and that is the typical situation of Europe. 
So there is, uh, uh, this is only looking at here at, at the pure beef, beef sector. The specialized beef would be in the order of 63 CO2 equivalent emissions, and that is heavily dependent on feed digestibility, on productivity rates, and also to the extent that land use change is, is implicated in the use of producing, in, in producing beef. 43% uh, is enteric fermentation, something that is very difficult to change uh, as such, but of course speeding up uh, the fattening process and making animals more productive is, is the ch chief way of reducing this. There is uh, feed production, and here there would be fertilization of pastures, uh, concentrates, and so on that have emissions as well. And then deforestation is a substantial chunk as well. Uh, the fact here that uh, beef animals uh, are fed on pastures in, in, uh, in South America in particular where pastures uh, replace forest, and that releases substantial amounts of, substantial amounts of CO2. Um, a regional overview, and uh, here the notion that uh, the poorer, the, the lower the productivity, the higher the emission intensity. So South Asia with uh, a system that is not geared towards beef altogether, that is a pure dairy system and where in certain states of India it is forbidden to slaughter cattle at all. So here you have very high emissions because the meat output is very low. Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa, same thing, meat output is low, productivity is low, so you have a lot of uh, emissions per kilogram of, 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 uh, or per kilogram of meat. And here we have Central and South America and you see that this is the part that is attributable to deforestation. So this explains the large variability and it tells you that uh, significant changes can be made by improving the productivity of animals who are in this place here and also in this place. If you bring that, if you, if you compare the other regions, they are all in a, in a different category basically. So moving on from that to, to dairy, um, uh, again, looking at emissions, these are 2.5% of total, 2.7% of total anthropogenic emissions. The dairy beef will have to be added to that, so the total is four. So these are animals that are a byproduct of the dairy system, so to say. The global emission intensity of milk is 2.4 kilograms of CO2. Again, feed digestibility and productivity are main sources are main determinants of the size of the emissions. Uh, again, more than half of the emissions are uh, methane from enteric fermentation. You have feed production and also manure as other sources of emissions. Uh, again, the variability is huge and the same picture more or less emerges that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia have by far the highest emissions and uh, you know, North America and Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia and so on, are all in the range from one to 1.5. Now if you plot this and assign, uh, look at a within region comparison, you find that you know, the most uniform region in terms of emission intensity, no this is not emission intensity, I'm wrong here. This is nitrogen use efficiency, so it compares the uh, amount of nitrogen contained in feed to the amount of nitrogen that you can harvest in the form of milk and meat. So the best systems have an efficiency of maybe 33%. So it means that one third of the nitrogen that is contained in feed you are able to harvest. Two thirds are lost to the environment uh, as nitrous oxides, as ammonia, different forms of emissions, mostly into the atmosphere to a certain extent into the ground. So uh, then you have systems which are 5% in this. So you're losing 95% of the nitrogen. So it is kind of difficult to imagine that systems like this will still exist in 100 years from now where you lose 95% of the nitrogen in a production process. I, maybe you can take the light bulb as an example. The first light bulb had an efficiency of 1%. You know, all 99% was, was heat. And with these uh, modern lamps here, we are 
uh, up to 40, 50, sometimes 60 percent of efficiency. So we need a similar process here where we retain more of the nitrogen in, in the milk. The point I wanted to make here is the big differences between countries that, you know, in, for example, Central America, the range goes from 7 to 25 percent. So these are countries which are more or less in the same region, same similar uh, environmental conditions, and yet you have these huge differences in nitrogen use efficiency. Look at East and Southeast Asia. Again, this goes from 3 to maybe uh, 32. So these are huge differences in nitrogen use efficiency, which, in my understanding, uh, bring the potential of closing these, of moving uh, the lower end much up to uh, higher performances. This shows a similar concept here. This is, again, going back to emission intensity. So every dot here is, is a country. And um, every country has a national average of milk production. Of course, uh, Sweden is, is here, I'm told. So I'm, I apologize for the problem. I did not look at the latest statistics. I was told that Sweden is, is this dot here, the red dot, which I missed on the map. So apologies for that. But what it shows is that with productivity growth, with who moving from lower performance to high performance, the emission intensity goes down. Emission intensity meaning the CO2 equivalent emissions per liter of milk uh, corrected by fat and protein. So uh, a system in, in Africa or in India or in Pakistan or, or maybe even in South America that manages to have an, a yield increase from maybe about 1,000 to maybe 3,000 can reduce their emissions per liter of milk by something like two-thirds. So a very significant improvement in terms of um, climate change gas emissions that can be made by simply driving up productivity. So this is why we think that closing the efficiency gap is an important concept to reduce uh, environmental impact. And we think time has come because of what I said before, that the resource constraints that the resource constraints, the natural resource constraints, they have started to bite. They're felt by farmers. They, they, they know that they have to innovate, that they have to move technology-wise, and they are under pressure to move to better practices. Uh, and they will see that moving uh, up on the efficiency scale will also improve productivity, and then there will be able to be uh, economic gains as well as environmental gains. We have seen that these gaps between attainable and actually attained efficiency rates are quite high and can be closed with existing technology, breeding, reproductive health, um, feeding strategies, husband, simple husbandry measures, uh, supplementary feeding I've mentioned. All these things can pull, be pulled together in, in improving technology and getting to higher efficiency rates. And the underlying thought is that while you here in, in Uppsala may be focusing on pushing the technological, the, the frontier of science, trying to maybe squeeze out a couple of percent more from your cow or making it more efficient by a couple of percent more, globally there's much more gain in moving the masses of producers which are currently poorly performing to acceptable levels of performance, closing this gap rather than moving the, the science frontier from our perspective. That is the development perspective, not necessarily the science perspective. Science is important as we need to continue to generate new technology, new, new knowledge, but um, given the problems that we have globally, we are more interested in closing the gap with um, poor performers. Uh, moving to a, a second theme that we have looked at and that we would want to develop in more detail. I've already talked about extensive grazing areas and the fact that these areas are neglected for a number of reasons. And they are also a lot of people who are neglected, uh, where the incidence of poverty is the highest than, is higher than anywhere else. These are people who very often live in abject poverty and, as I said before, have very little alternatives. But we think that these areas could be much more useful if we improve uh, the institutional arrangements and if we improve the way these uh, extensive grazelands are managed. Importantly, there is the potential to sequester carbon. And um, these rates are 
perhaps not very uh, interesting, but uh, these are 130 to 810 kilogra uh, kilograms of CO2 that can be captured uh, every year. But if you simply use uh, ETF, uh, the, in the European trading scheme for, for carbon, maybe at uh, 20 or 30 kilogram, um, dollars per, per ton of carbon, these can be significant amounts. So if we find a way of uh, compensating farmers, herders, for improving their grassland management and allowing the capturing of carbon and plowing these benefits into the system, there could be strong benefits to move to more sustainable forms of grassland management. These are the degraded grasslands as we, as the UNEP LADA project has uh, identified them. They're a little bit all over the world. They're not uh, confined to developing countries, even though in Africa there's a lot, uh, Central Asia and uh, China, there's a lot, Latin America, of course, but even in the US and in Russia and in Australia. These are common problems, and there's some estimation that about one-third of the total grasslands are severely or moderately uh, degraded. Uh, and this shows the carbon um, sequestration potential, where this would be highest, looking at uh, soil characteristics, looking at uh, uh, temperature and uh, humidity regimes, and it is the sort of moist to semi-arid conditions where uh, the potential is highest. So this would be uh, the savanna <coughs> belt in, in West Africa. It would be uh, these dryland areas here, but sometimes also highland areas where the potential for sequestering carbon, carbon is highest. And very often these are the most fragile environments that, uh, that, that are being used. So uh, we think, or that's our working hypothesis, that the use of carbon finance and payment for environmental services can alter the production function of grasslands, and particularly in marginal areas. And one of the objectives that we have set for ourselves is to develop a business case for, for grasslands uh, so as to uh, make it part of an international carbon trading scheme, uh, or at least to mobilize um, funding along the sides, along the lines that have been developed for RET, for the um, reduction of emissions from deforestation and degradation, where a lot of money has been mobilized and where a few key countries championed the course and where there is the promise that this will be used for improvements of uh, forest areas and will stop degradation and deforestation in some places. The important issue here is that certification methodologies need to be developed. You need to certify that carbon has been sequestered, and this is the uh, technical challenge because the local conditions can be very diverse, and importantly because in developed countries a lot of the grazing land is under common property regime and is not privately owned. You need to find institutional me mechanisms for benefit sharing, uh, and that is an institutional challenge that uh, we'll still need to address. Moving to the third area, the intensive systems, and here we have set the objectives of trying to move towards zero discharge, that large-scale industrial pigs, poultry, and dairy operations no longer emit waste into the environment, liquid waste in particular, and uh, this is based on the notion that very often the land that you need to apply waste uh, from your livestock operation is not available because you're too far away from, uh, from cropland where this could be applied. So the issue of geographic concentration, which I will just uh, graphically explain in a moment, is, is a big problem. We have calculated that the total amount of nutrients that is contained in livestock waste actually exceeds what is being applied to crops in the form of synthetic fertilizer. So it is a huge resource of, of nutrients, a lot of which is not used. 50 to 90% of the nutrients contained in feed, I've shown this uh, with the example of, of, uh, of nitrogen, is excreted as manure. So it's lost, which is particularly worrying in the case of nitrogen. 30% of the energy is lost, can be captured in the form of biogas, and nutrients can be also captured 
and be recycled back onto the land, with, again, the exception of nitrogen, because it is so volatile, uh, it is really difficult to, to capture. But um, there are improvements possible also here. And then, because of this dispersion, of this concentration process, we need to have policies that address the spatial distribution of livestock in order to connect livestock production back to land to be able to close nutrient cycles as the traditional mixed farming system did, but that may no longer be an option because we need economies of scale, so farms need to be large, but still we can connect specialized large operations, livestock operations with crop operations in order to have nutrient cycling. Just to show how the concentration works, we have uh, three epicenters of uh, pig production. We have East Asia, we have Western Europe, and we have the US. So basically, 90% of all pigs are in these three areas. And then you look at one country. Here you have the US, and you'll see that uh, more than 50% of the pig production in the US is just in two states, Iowa and North Carolina. This is where the pig production takes place. And then you wonder, if you look a level deeper, this is North Carolina. <laughs> it's not spread, actually, over North Carolina. It's all on the coastal plain here. And 45% of all pigs are in just two of the 100 counties. So you see how much this is concentrated. And I've joked also, you know, you don't, you don't want to live there because uh, this place is full of flies, it's full of smell. Uh, your rivers would be uh, rather ugly. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of debate in the U.S. about this place here, which is the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay, uh, where, in fact, uh, there's lots of uh, lawsuits going on, lots of uh, legal battles about, uh, about this, this story here. So uh, if we want to move towards zero discharge, we need to look at spatial policies, we need to address land-livestock balances, and to create the opportunities for recycling. We need emission standards. They can be voluntary, but very often they will probably need to be non-voluntary. That is imposed by the government. And we need uh, waste management technology transfer and adaptation. Most of that technology is available, but is not put into place because it doesn't pay. Um, and therefore, you may want to think of incentive policies. Now, the Kyoto Protocol has uh, one mechanism in it, the Clean Development Mechanism, CDM, which is a way of um, paying producers for avoided emissions in developing countries, and certain countries, Mexico, Brazil, Thailand, have used this to um, accelerate uh, biogas construction in, in the case of uh, pig farming in particular. So uh, I want just to take a little bit of time to explain more in detail what we have in mind to address this uh, long shadow and to shrink it. And we are in the process, uh, with uh, also the help of uh, some of your colleagues, to uh, develop a global agenda of action in support of sustainable livestock sector development. And I'm going back a little bit to these three features of the livestock sector that put it aside from the rest of, of uh, agriculture. So the first one we have is uh, closing the efficiency gap, which, uh, I'm sorry, um, here we go, closing the efficiency gap, restoring value to grasslands, and, and zero discharge. So uh, the first one is this one here. So the uh, game changer, if you want, is that the natural resource constraint has started to bite. It is perceived increasingly by stakeholders and producers and retailers and the entire food supply chain is worrying about the future sustainability of what they are doing. So um, this is why in our initiative we have uh, involved a number of stakeholders. We are talking to our traditional partners and that is governments, uh, but we are also talking to the private sector, which for FAO is quite a, a novelty, and uh, maybe for you it is also quite a novelty, in, for at least for some of you, but we are actively uh, seeking to work with the private sector because that's where most of the knowledge sits these days. Uh, maybe 30 years ago, uh, most of the knowledge would still be with publicly funded universities and not so much with the private sector, but that has certainly changed. Then, because of, uh, again, changes in societies and the fact that the civil society gets more and more organized, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, 
uh, they also have a voice and they are consulted systematically on, on everything we do and they are also taking part in our activities. Then, importantly, we would like to work with people like you because on something that is as controversial as livestock, we need to have scientific underpinning on, on everything that, that we do. And then, as FAO, this is intergovernmental organizations, so this will be animals like uh, FAO or the World Bank or UNEP or other intergovernmental multilateral organizations. So we're trying to put all these different stakeholder groups together. They all have different um, skills and capacities that they can bring to the table. And the first thing that we want to do when it comes to closing the efficiency gap is trying to measure efficiency in a way that is commonly agreeable. As you perfectly know, there's many different units that one can use, there's many different ways of measuring it, and we would want to have a sort of harmonized methodology of doing this. We would then like to assess natural resource use efficiency for different regions, for different commodity systems, for different species, and then identify the options that are available to close the gaps. We would then want to develop private-public partnerships and other models to transfer technology. And again, you would see here that the private sector needs to be prominently involved. And then we would want to move to investment programs, both publicly and privately funded. And the expected result will be that we have more knowledge-intensive practices where natural resource use efficiency is higher. Restoring value to grasslands, uh, again here, the game changer being the prospect of introducing carbon finance or payment for environmental services more generally. And by that, we can uh, improve uh, the resilience and productivity of grasslands. Uh, again, we have the different stakeholders here. We would want to start by assessing and targeting the potential for carbon sequestration in a more detailed fashion. So that's a little bit of a death study that needs to be done with on the ground, on the ground truthing. And then uh, to develop these monitoring and reporting verification methodologies, we have one case study, which I don't want to go into detail, but we are working on a project in Shanghai in, in China, where we have developed a methodology and we have submitted the protocol for this methodology to the voluntary carbon market for that to become a certified methodology. So at least on the voluntary carbon market, companies and so on can buy carbon that uh, poor livestock farmers in the uh, mountains of central China have captured. Um, piloting institutional and technical approaches and then develop intergovernmental support for grasslands within the United Nations framework or Convention on Climate Change. As a result, we would expect that pastoralists adopt practices that provide environmental services and improve food security. The last one, the recovery of nutrients and energy from animal manure. Uh, here, our game changer is that people are fed up with not so much uh, the nutrient losses, but with the smell and the flies. Now, that is what people angers. Uh, but a more general uh, perception that you know, companies like this should not, or firms like this, producers like this, should not be polluted, should not be allowed to pollute as they wish. So uh, we would want to analyze the clustering trend. We would want to develop regional capacity building and policy assistance networks to create opportunities for nutrient recycling and energy recovery, perhaps through uh, incentive policies and, again, private-public partnerships. Towards reduced or zero emissions, in the end, you would have increased nutrient re and energy recovery from animal manure and reduced pol pollution. The importance being that we are trying here to again pull together the various capacities of stakeholders and making it a joint action. So the substance is again perhaps expressed here that we are trying to have a thematic focus that is both uh, politically and technically acceptable. And that's a little bit the conundrum that we've been uh, grappling with over the last five years where uh, the controversy wasn't actually very fruitful in many, in many ways. And that we want to move into a certain direction, and that direction is a higher resource use efficiency and putting what we know into practice. And then, importantly, that we do this through multi-stakeholder 
engagement where we have a convergence of ideas and interest and an action orientation. So um, again, uh, maybe what could be the bottom line uh, that uh, if you want to reduce livestock's long shadow, then um, of course some people may say uh, consumption is the problem. So if we all stop, stop eating meat or eat less meat, then everything will be fine. Uh, there is an issue here that from experience with other food issues, this is a slow and difficult process. And there's also an ethical problem when you tell people what to eat. People get nervous and don't actually like that. So you are, it's an infringement on your personal liberty, if you want. But at the same time, business as usual is not an option either. And I think I've made a convincing case that it can't go on as it does. So this is why you know, we think that through this series of action, and particularly focusing on efficiency gains, livestock sector growth can be accommodated through alignment of incentives, through change of practices, through continued technological innovation, and through development and refinement of institutions. An option is also to shift to animal products with lower environmental footprint, something that is already ongoing because of the shift towards poultry products and the shift away from beef in particular, but there is also quite some gain to be made with shifts in, from one animal product to the other, including also fish. But then, and I think I've been able to show this, there's also a large potential for the provision of environmental services. We should not look at livestock as something that is only creating a nuisance. I think there's large potential environmental services if we manage livestock in a way that improves water resources, that improves biodiversity, and that, as I think I have shown, also helps us to sequester carbon, to capture carbon, particularly looking at the extent of grasslands worldwide. So um, I think it is important to not put the livestock sector just as, as one thing. I think we need to differentiate. And here I've just tried to differentiate a little bit what I would call the new narrative for the livestock sector. And just uh, bear with me a, a moment here. This is what we are interested in from a public good perspective. We are worried about the environment. We are worried about poverty and social cohesion and welfare and so on. We are worried about nutrition, human nutrition, and we are also considered concerned about health, both animal health and human health. So we're having areas like the partial areas, like very poor areas, where there is no growth. And what do you do with the environment here? You will still have to try to restore the grasslands and to restore or at least to preserve the marginal lands to the best you can. Here on the social side, you may say, well, there's not much we can do in terms of development. But what we need to do is to protect the livelihoods. You know, make sure that in the absence of any alternative, these people you know, at least are able to survive. And the nutrition objective is to avoid starvation. It's not anything else. It's really, we are really at the, at the bare minimum here in areas where, which are rather destitute and, and, and very marginal. And from a health point of view, perspective, you would need to try to keep your animals alive and to try to keep your production systems functional, which is difficult enough because there's encroachment from all sides. You know, these people have no place to go and resources are taken away from them again and again. Then we have areas where there is a prospect or already ongoing growth in the livestock sector. And here the efficiency agenda is very important because you would like to accelerate that process so as to avoid this, this middle ground where things aren't actually working quite well. The social perspective here would be, yes, you, know, you want to push income and employment and you would want to bring as many people into the production process and to have them benefit from livestock sector growth as much as you can. Since the diets aren't very good yet, you know, of course, you need to enrich their diets and make them enjoy what most people in this room also enjoy, and that is a varied and rich diet. And from a health perspective, you would need to remove the constraints from the animal health side to production, productivity, and trade. Moving to areas like uh, where all this has happened already and where you have had the livestock revolution and now you are eating well and so on, 
So you're having problems of growth, you know, where you've overshot to a certain extent. And here you would have to avoid pollution and to maintain landscapes. Think of your own country. Uh, from a social perspective, you want to sustain prosperity. From a nutrition perspective, you want to avoid unhealthy diets. And maybe you want to reduce your intake of livestock products. And from a health perspective, you want to uh, target safe and healthy food. It goes a little bit back to what Ulf has shown in this uh, um, diamond diagram where he had food security, social, environmental, and so on. This is just to say the livestock sector is not a single animal. It's a couple of animals, and they're quite distinctly different. And, and we need to contextualize our debate because just talking about livestock is or livestock are um, and then a statement is probably not correct. We made the comment that if you make a statement about livestock and it fits onto one line, it is probably wrong because it is, uh, it is uh, more complex than that. So with that, uh, I think I have completed. Thank you.